Hello and welcome back to Media Beat. I'm Chris Ahrens, Editorial Director here at MediaBistro.com. And we're talking with Chris Lick, the Vice President of Programming for CBS News, former executive producer of Morning Joe on MSNBC. And he's written What I Learned When I Almost Died, a great, great book. Um, so let's, let's go back to that day, Wednesday, April 28, 2010. You've just finished that day's Morning Joe in Washington, D.C. Right. It's been a tough morning, there about something about camera angles, and right. Joe wasn't very happy. And you get in the car back to your hotel, and what happens? Um, I actually um, was on the phone listening to a voicemail of the most inane variety mm -hmm. about something with like logistics about cars or something, something that was just like, what? And I'm just about to hang up the voicemail and call this person back and go, are you kidding me? And I just heard a pop in my head. And immediately, I had the worst headache I had ever felt in my life. Worst pain, like, you can't even really describe it as a headache. Yeah. Uh, it was just horrific pain in my head. A vice. Yeah, like someone was squeezing around my head and it kind of went from here to here. Um, and I immediately, you know, because when you're in local news, you always have, and which I grew up in local news, so mm -hmm. you have stroke awareness month or you have, you know, news you can use about not dying from a stroke. So I knew all the things to look and for. And now right? it's coming back to you when you <laughs> need exactly. it. So I, okay. Do I vi okay, I don't have blurry vision. You know, I said to the driver, well, there's a lot of traffic. Okay, I could talk. Uh, I'm not slurring my words. And it's weird because your brain, which is undergoing this trauma, is trying to diagnose what's going on with itself. So it's a very strange kind of thing. And I, I picked up the uh, phone and called my, uh, my, my dad, who's a doctor, mm -hmm. and he didn't answer. <laughs> so I called my mom, and Did she's you? a physician's associate. So she said, you know, you probably should go to the hospital. And um, luckily, the hotel was literally across the street from the hospital. Mm -hmm. So I had the fortune of being already on the way to the hospital when this happened. And that is a big reason why things turned out the way they did. Yeah. What, would you, what word would you use to describe the first few hours of this crisis? Well, it's, uh, you know, the, the first diagnosis I got was from a resident. This young doctor said to me, um, you know, do you have a stressful job? I said, uh, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> she said, well, I think you're having a stress migraine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you something for the pain, and then I'm going to come back. And we're going to talk about some things you can do to manage your stress. So I, you know, so I have a sort of relief. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I'm having a migraine. But then I think when she went back and told her superior, the doctor said, you know what? Why don't you go and do a CAT scan? And they rushed me into a CAT scan. When they came back and told me the results of the CAT scan, which was there was a significant amount of bleeding on my brain mm -hmm. and that I'd probably had an aneurysm, um, that was almost worse because this is now no longer, okay, I'm going to, get something for the pain, go back to the hotel, get ready for tonight, show tomorrow, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. This is now, everything on my calendar is wiped out for at least a month, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I might die. I mean, it was, it was a completely irrational panic, I think, and, and really, really scared. You're getting the best care imaginable, arranged in part by Vice President Biden, somebody who had made a call on your behalf. Mika called him. And then he calls. He called the doctor and said, can you go see my friend in the emergency room? And he room. had, Biden had had a, an aneurysm when he was younger. Which well. is why Mika called him. Mika didn't, yeah. Joe actually thought of it. Mika didn't call because she thought it would get me better treatment at the hospital. He's, he's just, he's somebody who had been through it. Right. Um, You're feeling out of control. And for someone who spends his life in control, running three hours of live on scripted television every day, what was that feeling like? Totally foreign. I, I had zero control over anything, nothing. Where I was going to be, uh, who was doing what to me, what medicine I was taking. Mean, it, was, it was a complete, the first time I've ever felt a sensation of zero control of my own destiny. And, 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 and literally, what happens with this, with this kind of hemorrhage is you can either die right away or you can die that day or you can die in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what they were doing was trying to prevent that. So you're hospitalized for a week at uh, GW? Almost 10 days. 10 days. Uh, then you make it back to New York, uh, and then you're off for another few weeks before yeah. uh, you go back to the show. But uh, you're at home, and you get a call from NBC. And they ask you if you've checked in with the Disability Center. Yeah. And uh, you write that it just felt cold and bloodless. Um, because here you are, devoting your life, giving your life to 
this show, this network, this company for so many years, and now you were the disabled guy. Yeah, and and I, I'm, they certainly didn't mean anything by it, and it wasn't. It just it just put me in a category that you never thought you'd be in. One of the fears you have is as a you know, guy running a show, and something like this happens, are they going to think any less of you? Are people going to treat you like, okay, you know, don't want to give you another brain hemorrhage? And I think that. That Didn't phone they? call. Well, when I first got back, they did. Mm -hmm. I think I, well, my, my first couple of days back, everybody was like, "How are you?" Mm -hmm. You know, the good news was like for for two weeks, anything I asked for for the show, I got, got. because people were afraid of saying no. I'd keel over and you know yeah. die. So yeah. I had a little bit of a honeymoon period there. But that phone call just sort of triggered this. Wow, I'm I'm in a different sort of category mm -hmm. now, and I I hope that that doesn't affect things. You know, people not wanting to you know, promote me or whatever. You know, it's weird thoughts like that, that, right. that you're now somehow damaged goods. Right. Uh, we're talking with Chris Lick, the author of What I Learned When I Almost Died, and next segment we're going to talk about what he did learn uh, when he almost died and how he has lived his life a little bit differently since then. We'll be back.